Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to go through the interpretation and initial management of non-visible hematuria, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. And for that, I will summarize a variety of guidelines and medical publications, including NICE guidance and advice provided by a number of NHS bodies in the UK. Right, so let's jump into it. And the reason why this subject generates so many questions is because when it comes to non-visible hematuria, we're often unsure if and when patients need to be referred and whether they should be referred to urology, nephrology or bowels. Metro-analysis have demonstrated that there is insufficient trial evidence from high-quality studies to answer questions relevant to clinical care. And therefore, clinical pathways are based on consensus agreement and expert opinions. These have changed over the years, and although the joint consensus statement of the Renal Association and British Association of Urological Surgeons has been superseded since they were published in 2008, most of their recommendations remain valid and have been incorporated into primary care pathways with only fairly minor changes. And these pathways are going to be the basis of our review today. And before we start, let's clarify some basic concepts. As you probably know, we should no longer use the terms macroscopic and microscopic hematuria, but visible and non-visible hematuria instead. In addition, non-visible hematuria can be subdivided into symptomatic non-visible hematuria when there are some urinary symptoms, and asymptomatic non-visible hematuria when it's just an incidental detection without symptoms. This should really be a rarity because we should only check for hematuria for clinical reasons and not opportunistically. And why is this? Non-visible hematuria is present in about 2.5% of the general population, although it can be as high as 20% depending on the study group. But the overall incidence of serious conditions is less than 1.5%. This is why there is consensus that general screening for non-visible hematuria is not warranted. The next question is, what is better, a dipstick or microscopy? And the answer is that the tester's choice is a urine dipstick or urinalysis. Microscopy, because it misses simulized the materia and because of delays in the processing of the urine samples, has a significant false negative rate. Furthermore, the procedure is more labor intensive and therefore it is not recommended. What is a positive result? Well, scores of one plus or more are considered positive and both non-hemolyzed and hemolyzed results are of equal significance. On the other hand, a trace of blood should be regarded as a negative result. The next question is, what is significant hematuria? And well, significant hematuria is either any single episode of visible hematuria or any single episode of symptomatic non-visible hematuria, obviously not due to a UTI or another transient cause, or persistent asymptomatic non-visible hematuria. And persistent is defined as two out of three positive dipsticks. Transient and spurious causes that need to be excluded before establishing the presence of significant hematuria are, for example, a UTI and a repeat dipstick test that treatment of the infection will determine whether hematuria is persistent, exercise-induced hematuria, such as seen in long-distance runners, and in these cases, urine testing should be repeated at least three days after such activity, myoglobinuria, as seen in rhabdomyolysis, when myoglobin is released from necrotic muscle cells, and menstruation leading to urinary contamination, and the urine test should be repeated as the menstruation has stopped. So, what are the causes of persistent non-visible hematuria? And obviously, the main worry is cancer. And according to NICE, non-visible hematuria is only a reason for an urgent cancer referral to exclude bladder cancer if the non-visible hematuria appears in a person aged 60 and over with either dysuria or a raised white cell count and a full blood count. For all other cases, Hematuria only features as a cancer sign if it is visible in the over 45s, 
like in renal and bladder cancers, or if it is visible and with a raised PSA in the case of prostate cancer. Other possible known cancer causes of non-visible hematuria can be urological or nephrological. Examples of some relatively common urological causes of hematuria can be benign prostatic hyperplasia, calculus disease, prostatitis or urethritis, and urethral strictures. The most common nephrological causes are IgA nephropathy or Burgess disease and thin basement membrane disease. And finally, we will also bear in mind that hematuria should not be attributed to anticoagulant therapy and these patients should be fully evaluated regardless of their anticoagulation. Once a UTI has been excluded, the initial investigations for patients with non-visible hematuria, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, are a blood test for full blood count and renal function tests, a urine test for albumin creatinine ratio or ACR, a blood pressure check, and we will consider an INR if the patient is on anticoagulants, and a PSA, a further MSU, and an ultrasound scan if clinically indicated. And then we will consider whether referral is necessary. But who should patients be referred to? Well, a urological cause is more likely in patients with visible hematuria, symptomatic non-visible hematuria, whatever their age, and asymptomatic non-visible hematuria if they are aged 40 or over, although the age threshold will vary depending on the guideline that you look at. So in these cases, initial referral to urology is recommended. Younger patients, generally under 40 or 45 years of age, with asymptomatic non-visible hematuria, are more likely to have a renal cause. Nephrology referral is not always necessary unless performing a renal biopsy is going to be justified. So the risk factors that should definitely trigger a nephrology referral with a view to a renal biopsy are proteinuria with an ACR of 30 or more or a PCR of 50 or more, an EGFR less than 60, or hypertension that is a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. There are a few primary care guidelines governing non-visible hematuria and have reviewed the South East London Hematuria Guideline as well as the North and Central London Hematuria Pathway. They both cover this area very clearly and you can find the links to them in the episode description. These pathways cover both visible and non-visible hematuria, but here I have only summarized the non-visible hematuria section of the pathway. I have combined them, creating a streamlined pathway so that it is clear from a primary care perspective. You can also find a link to download the summary in the episode description. So let's have a look at it. Right, so we start with checking the urine dipstick and we find that there is non-visible hematuria. Then we ask ourselves, has the patient got symptoms? And if they do, we will ask ourselves, do we suspect a UTI? And if the answer is yes, we will treat it and recheck the urine dipstick after the antibiotics. If there's no UTI, we will then investigate with a blood test for a full blood count and renal function tests, a urine test for ACR, and we will check the blood pressure. We will also consider an INR if the patient is an anticoagulant and a PSA, a repeat MSU and an ultrasound scan if clinically indicated. And after that, we will ask ourselves, is the patient over 60 with dysuria or a raised white cell count on a full blood count? And if the answer is yes, then they would meet the cancer referral criteria, so we would make an urgent cancer referral to urology. If the answer is no, this is where some of the guidance varies. Some guidelines will say that we can just monitor these patients in primary care, but others will recommend referral. So on this occasion, I have taken the conservative approach and recommend that we should refer the patient, or at the very least, seek specialist advice. And then we will look at the patient's age. And again, the age threshold can vary depending on the guideline that you consult. But generally, if a patient is over 45, 
we will do a routine urology referral because urological causes would be more common in this age group. And conversely, if the patient is under 45, it would be a routine nephrology referral. And we will make this referral, especially if the investigations show abnormalities, like, for example, an EGFR below 60, an ACR of 30 or more, a PCR of 50 or more, or if the blood pressure is higher than 140 over 90. Now, if we go back up to the beginning and we find that the patient has non-visible hematuria, but does not have any symptoms, then we will need to repeat the test to confirm it, and we will do so for up to three occasions. We will then ask ourselves if at least two out of three dipstick tests have come back positive. And if the answer is yes, then we will investigate and rejoin the pathway that we have just explored. If the answer is no, as a precaution, we will check for proteinuria and we will check the patient's albumin creatinine ratio or ACR. If the ACR is normal, then we can reassure the patient and stop here. But if the ACR is high, then we will investigate the patient with the standard investigations already mentioned, and following a conservative approach, we would consider seeking specialist advice or refer the patient to nephrology. If you have any doubts, here at the bottom you have the links to the original pathways that have consulted to create this summary. Finally, patients with persistent non-visible hematuria not meeting criteria for referral or who have been referred and have had normal investigations will need long-term monitoring, usually in primary care, due to the uncertainty of the underlying diagnosis. Patients should be monitored for the development of symptoms, visible hematuria, significant or increasing proteinuria, progressive renal impairment with a falling EGFR, and hypertension. So the NICE guideline on CKD says that annual follow-up of these patients should continue for as long as the non-visible hematuria persists, and it should include repeat dipstick testing for hematuria, review of symptoms, a blood test to check renal function and EGFR, a urine test for ACR, and a blood pressure check. Referral or re-referral to urology will be needed if a patient develops at any stage either visible hematuria or symptomatic non-visible hematuria. A nephrology referral will be needed if there is deteriorating renal function, that is a drop in EGFR more than 5 within the previous year, or more than 10 within the past five years, CKD stage 4 or 5, that is when the EGFR is less than 30, or if there is proteinuria with an ACR of 30 or more, or a PCR of 50 or more. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.